Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Adopt US Kids webinar, Meeting Families' Needs, Assessing Your Support Service Array. We're really excited to have you join us here today. Um, as we're getting started, I want to let you know that uh, we have a few of us presenting. I am Alicia Grow, a consultant with the Adopt US Kids Project. We also have Britt Cloudsdale with our Adopt US Kids Family Support Team, and Mary Boo, manager of the Adopt US Kids Support Team. We have a few housekeeping points we want to comment on before we get into the content of our presentation. We do have some handouts available for you, and those will be available in the uh, chat box. So we'll get those links chatted out to you, and they'll also be in a follow-up email after this webinar, so you can access those handouts. This webinar is being recorded, uh, and we will have that recording available uh, in the coming weeks so that you can review it and share it with colleagues. The webinar will be approximately 90 minutes long. We do want this to be interactive, so although your phone lines are muted, you can ask questions through the questions pod, and we'll also have some polls throughout the webinar to get information from you, and including getting uh, input to help us demonstrate this support service uh, assessment tool that we're excited to show you today. We also want to make sure that we get evaluation feedback from all of you, so we'll be sending an evaluation uh, survey by email shortly after this webinar closes. So uh, for those of you who may not know, um, Adopt US Kids is a national project funded by the US Children's Bureau, and we have a two-pronged mission. So the first part is to raise public awareness about the need for foster adoptive families for children in the public child welfare system. And the second part of our mission is to assist states, tribes, and territories in recruiting, engaging, developing, and supporting foster adoptive families. And we accomplish our mission in partnership with child welfare systems uh, in several ways. We have many parts of our project, including a national adoption and foster care information system, a national photo listing service. On that uh, photo listing service, we feature approximately 5,000 children, teens who are waiting to be adopted, as well as uh, families who have been approved and home studied to adopt. We also operate a national adoption recruitment campaign. We have our Adoptive and Foster Family Support Project, which this uh, webinar is featuring some of our resources from. We also provide extensive capacity building and engagement services. And we have a minority professional leadership development in the field of adoption program. And we'll have some more information at the end of this webinar about an extended deadline for applying for the next cohort for that minority professional leadership development program. So for today's webinar, we have several goals that we're excited about. Uh, one is that we want to highlight the importance of assessing your system support services for families. And the fact that you've joined us for this webinar today uh, tells us that you probably already know about that importance, but we want to keep shining a light on that. We also want to share information about a new tool that we've developed for assessing your service array. And we want to share some strategies for ways to engage key stakeholders and partners in an effective assessment process using that tool. And then we want to highlight some additional resources that can help you strengthen support services in your state, tribe, or uh, county. So we'll be uh, covering all of those and hopefully achieving all of those goals for you today. So now, even though we can't see all of you, we do want to know who we have in the room, uh, so to speak. So we're going to do a quick poll to find out who is attending. Uh, so I'm going to launch a poll for you here. And if you could just let us know, select uh, the answer that best fits your agency or organization that you're affiliated with. Uh, we're wondering if we have public agency, private agency, uh, independent parent group associations, or others. and we. We think we have a, a wide mix here, so we'll give it just another maybe 15 seconds. I see most of you have voted, and then I can display the results so you can all see who else is on this webinar today. All right, let's show who we have. So primarily we have public agency uh, staff with us, but also uh, about a third of you are with private child welfare agencies and then 9% uh, other. So that sounds like a great mix of people that we have here on the, on the webinar. So now I'm going to hand it over to my co-presenter, Britt Cloudsdale, and she's going to get into uh, a little more of this content. Britt? Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. I think I'm having yes. Okay, great. Nope. <laughs> 
my mute button is showing that it's that it's muting me, but I guess everybody can hear me, so that's great. Okay, um, so I um, I'm going to start by talking about the um, really important value that 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 well-supported families. When we talk about families, we're talking about foster, adoptive, and kinship families, as well as guardianship families. The value that well-supported families bring to our child welfare system as a whole. And as Alicia said, we're not going to belabor this point too much because we know that you guys are uh, really, really um, well-connected with this uh, just by, be, by virtue of being a part of this webinar today. But we do want to make sure that we keep it centered as we talk about um, the various um, uh, services that we provide and the, the value that it brings to our system. Um, so well-supported families, first of all, um, they increase our, um, our overall placement stability for the kids in our systems, right? So if families are well-supported, um, both during um, uh, times of less turmoil, but it's also in terms of uh, in times of crisis, um, they are going to um, be better prepared to weather those challenges, right? They're going to know that they have support available to them when they are um, experiencing hard times. Um, and they're going to know how to access those services and, and who to call when they have those those more challenging times, which which means that the children in their care are less likely to disrupt from those placements. And that means fewer moves for children, which we all know is, is really, really important. And it results in less trauma for the children in our care. Um, also, when, when families are well supported, um, they um, are better equipped to meet the, the needs of our kids that are in their care, um, whether temporarily or permanently, right? So families that are well prepared, um, that are well developed in understanding um, the, the needs of children who have experienced trauma, the diagnoses that they may encounter in those children, um, and the behaviors that they may encounter, um, when we prepare them adequately and support them through that, um, we know that, that the kids that are in their care are getting better care and that those families are better uh, prepared to, to navigate those, those various challenges. Um, we also know that, that families who are better supported are less likely to leave our, our child welfare systems and are more likely to continue in the service of, of, of our systems and of the children. Um, we also know um, that most of our systems across the country are, are challenged in um, maintaining a strong pool of, of, of foster, adoptive, and kinship families. Um, and we know that um, support services help to um, both maintain the families that are already um, in our system, but they also impact impact our ability to recruit new families into our systems as well, because we all know that, that foster families that are well supported and that are able to speak positively about the services that they're receiving in their home communities, um, that they are oftentimes our best recruiters, our best recruitment tools. Um, and so um, our, our support services and the services we're going to be talking about today, um, it has a much more far uh, farther reaching impact a lot of times than I think that we than we think that the, that it does and so um, all of these things combined together result in improved well-being outcomes for children for youth um, and for families in general um, which is what we all aim to do um, at the end of the day right so let's just keep that in mind as we continue to talk about this um, so for um, services that we provide for those support services to actually be supportive and effective for families, um, they not only need to be of high quality, they also need to be accessible to the families that they aim to serve, right? So if you have a really high quality service that's trauma-informed and adoption competent and it is evidence-based and everything is fantastic about it, um, if families can't access it, it's not actually an effective service, right? And I think that's important that we keep that um, in mind as we as we talk about our support service array and we talk about assessing it. Um, if you have one without the other, if you have high quality without accessibility, or if you have accessibility without high quality, um, you still may have an ineffective service. It's not doing the work that you hope it would do for your families in your system, right? Um, and to, to really understand what families experience within our systems, um, and to understand the, the challenges that we continue to have in, in maintaining a strong pool of foster, adoptive, and kinship families for our kids, we need to invest in robust assessments of the services we, that we provide, right? Um, while it's important to assess like one individual service or an individual service category, that will really only give you insight into how well that one service is doing, right? Assessing your, your full service array across your system will give you a much clearer picture of, of what families are actually experiencing on the whole, right? Of what they actually experience day to day in accessing services in your child welfare system. Um, it'll also help you prioritize as you seek to improve your system, right? Um, 
families don't have just one need and so they don't access just one service. They have a need for respite care. They have a need for peer support. They have need for ongoing training and education and for therapeutic interventions. Um, and they need all of these things to work well and to be effective in order to preserve their placements and their families overall, right? Um, so in, as we start to talk about um, the, um, uh, a new tool, that uh, Adoptius Kids has made available. And as we start to talk about how we engage in effective assessments, I do have a couple of polls that I would um, like to um, have you engage in um, to help us get this conversation started, okay? Um, so the first is, and you'll see it pop up on your screen now, um, is, is a lack of adequate services a barrier to placing children with foster adoptive families in your jurisdiction? So I'll just give folks a minute to select one of the uh, possible responses. There's yes in some parts of our jurisdiction, yes in most or all of our jurisdiction, no or I don't know. Just to give folks a moment here. Okay, I'm gonna close it and then share it with you guys here. Oh, more folks are voting, so I'll just give you guys another minute. Okay, okay, so right, we all, <laughs> we all are experiencing that, um, or, or the vast majority of us are experiencing that adequate services or lack thereof is a barrier um, to placing children with foster adoptive families in at least some part of our jurisdiction. Um, I, I think that we all um, know and feel that to be true, um, but it is important for us to, to, to keep that in mind that these services are, are really critically important, um, not just for the families that have placements right now, but for your systems in general, right? You're, you're being prevented from um, accessing all of the resources that you may have available to your kids and your system because you can't um, place service place children adequately in all parts of your jurisdiction due to lack of services. Okay, I'm going to hide the results of that. I'm going to do one more poll for you guys before we get um, into the tool itself here, okay? Um, and so the question is, does your child welfare system conduct assessments of your array of support services for foster, adoptive, and kinship families? So are you doing those assessments right now? Yes, no, or I don't know. And no shame if, if you're selecting no or I don't know. I think that's important to say here that um, assessments are hard, especially talking about our entire support service array. If we're talking about assessing that entire thing, that's, that's a big job, that's huge. I'm just gonna give folks another minute here. Okay. All right, I'll close it and I'll share that with you guys. Okay, so it's great that 24% of you guys are already engaged in some type of assessment. That's fantastic. I appreciate you guys sharing that you're not yet engaged with those type of assessments yet or you're not sure. We hope that this webinar today will help start those conversations in your system and that we will um, hopefully be able to assist you guys um, with this new tool that's available from Adopt US Kids as we go forward here, okay? So I'm gonna hide these results. Um, so as Alicia mentioned at the start of the webinar, we, we have um, a new tool that's available from Adopt US Kids. I'm gonna let Alicia um, talk a little bit about the, the purpose of the tool before we um, can really dive in and talk about how, uh, how the tool works. Alicia, you go ahead. Great, thanks Britt. So as you can probably tell, Britt and I are both very excited about this new tool and I think seeing your uh, poll results in terms of what percentage of you are in, are conducting assessments of your service array now or you're not sure um, to us that, that speaks to the need in the field for some additional support and, and tools to help make that kind of assessment possible. So um, we hope that walking through this today will really uh, provide some great ideas and give you some concrete tools for being able to do that if you think it'd be helpful. So this uh, support services assessment tool that we're introducing on this webinar and we'll be walking through in just a moment, um, we really envision it as having multiple purposes and, and we think that um, we'll keep hearing from those of you in the field who are using it about additional ways that you, you really see value in it. Um, so we, we look forward to that ongoing feedback from all of you. But in terms of the, the main purposes and goals for the tool as we developed it, one was to help leaders in child welfare systems identify areas of strength as well as gaps 
across these two domains that we've laid out. One is quality and one is accessibility, as Britt talked about. Um, we think that in order for a service array to be really effective and meaningful, those services need to be both of high quality and accessible. And we will get into how we've kind of operationalized those, those two domains. Um, we also want this tool to provide a, a framework for a meaningful assessment process in systems. And that can be systems really of any size. So it can be looking at, you know, at a, an individual county of, with services, if that's how things are, are provided. Um, it can be a full tribal assessment, a full state assessment. Uh, but we wanted to provide that framework that provides the structure, makes it easy to use, and then is adaptable to work in your various systems. And then, of course, ultimately, the purpose of the tool is to help those child welfare system leaders really strengthen the support services that are available for foster, kinship, and adoptive families. Um, we think all of this assessment should be done with that ultimate goal in mind of really ensuring that the services are in place that uh, children and families need. So um, that's the, the overarching Per, set of purposes. And then in terms of ways you can use the tool, we see it as being useful in many ways. Again, we hope to hear from all of you as you use it um, about additional ways that you're finding it helpful so we can share that with your peers around the country. Um, some of the ways that we've really specifically identified that you could use the tool, it, one is for a comprehensive assessment of your full service array. So that may be a, the, the sort of the large undertaking, um, the broad comprehensive assessment, looking at all of your range of support services across the full geographic area. Um, and that might be something that would be conducted periodically, but wouldn't be a, a frequent uh, assessment necessarily, since it would be a bigger undertaking. We also think the tool can be really helpful if you're in efforts for planning or revising um, budgets and figuring out what your budget needs are in terms of um, identifying possibly services to add or modify and certainly things to sustain if they're working well. But also could be helpful for putting together um, requests for bids or requests for proposals if you're contracting out uh, or doing grants for support services. This can provide a structure for thinking about what considerations you should have in place, what gaps you might need to fill, those kind of considerations. We also think the tool can be used in much more targeted ways. It might be a lighter lift. Um, so if you wanted to focus on specific areas of your jurisdiction that you're serving or specific service areas, service categories. Um, so if you wanted to look specifically at how both planned and emergency respite is working or uh, child and youth assessments are working, those kind of things, you could take that kind of focused, targeted approach with the tool and do this in possibly more bite-sized approaches. And then just as always, we think that the tool is a helpful connection to your other strategic planning efforts. So if you're doing um, agency or system strategic plans either for internal use or for part of federal reporting and federal planning, um, other action efforts, using this tool to help inform that broader strategic planning. We think this can really align with that nicely and, and connect to those efforts very closely. So as we think about um, how the tool can be helpful in your work, um, we think in addition to just giving you know, ultimately giving some picture of how your support service array looks and where there are strengths and where there might be areas you'd want to address or improve. Um, we think the process also has a lot of value for child welfare systems. So one of the things that we've really built into the, the tool and the guide for using the tool are tips for having meaningful conversations. And so we hope that this tool and the assessment process can really help encourage important and meaningful discussions among key stakeholders and help people hear um, various perspectives, um, especially if there are different perspectives between service providers and the service recipients. So if our families and our youth are telling us that services are perhaps not accessible or um, they may not be adoption competent, those kind of things, that's really important for us in the system to hear. Um, and even hear across a service providers and across agency staff to know, you know, it, just because we're ensuring a service is being delivered, do we know that that's really meeting children and families' needs? Or is it meeting their needs, but there's such a long wait list that we actually think we need to increase the capacity so more people can benefit from the service? So we think those discussions themselves really help draw out a lot of helpful insights. 
We also think that using the tool can help all of us in the system have a deeper understanding of which services really are having the best impact um, and are most helpful for our children and families. And know, so knowing what's working well, um, often we highlight gaps or where we're missing services or where there are challenges, but this can really look at what's working well, what do we need more of, what might we want to expand, um, and how do we make sure we sustain those things that are working, and also look at what can continue to help make our, our services and supports even more helpful, so we keep building on that success. And then uh, from a, an even broader lens for the process of this, conducting this assessment and using this tool can help really demonstrate that you value these diverse perspectives of the various people you'll engage in these assessments. Um, it, you know, that it shows that you really want to hear from community members, community providers, um, agency staff at multiple levels, um, families, youth, and really taking that, that you're, you're not just hearing that information, but that you're really valuing it and having it inform this overall assessment of your services. So I hope you're excited about this as well. Now we're really going to get into the full-on demonstration. So Britt, I will hand this back over to you. Awesome. I'm going to ask again if you guys could hear me. Can you confirm that? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm having a display issue. Okay. Um, before we get into actually taking a look at the tool itself, I wanted to, to briefly talk about um, the preparation um, that needs to happen before you would engage in this kind of assessment. Um, it is really important that um, you go into an assessment um, with a plan. Um, and so in order to do that, um, you need to first think about uh, what your goals are for the assessment um, and what, if any, parameters you may want to put on um, onto your assessment of your service array, um, as well as when you'd like the assessment process to be complete, when you need to start moving on to uh, more action planning, right? Um, so um, as Alicia mentioned, people engage in, in assessments for a variety of different reasons. Um, so it's important to, to take a moment, um, perhaps with um, stakeholders that you're engaging in your process, um, to think about uh, why you're doing this. Uh, think about what you hope to learn um, as a part of your assessment. Um, you know, uh, maybe you're um, uh, really wanting to learn more about specifically how your services are working for kinship families, or maybe you're really wanting to, to learn about how your system is working for families in rural communities or, or something like that. Um, maybe it's something we haven't thought of at all, um, but you, your unique system is going to um, and your unique needs are going to define where you go, right? And so it's really important to, to take a step back first and think about what you hope to accomplish as, as, a, as a function of this assessment. Um, as you're going to see in a moment, um, because I'm going to, um, we're actually going to go and take a look at the tool um, in just a moment, um, the tool is, is customizable. Um, and so you can really tailor it uh, to the needs of your system. Um, so if, uh, for example, if, um, if you're a, a county administered system, um, you can um, decide to um, really uh, uh, set, change, change up the way that the tool looks or works um, and really dig in there for um, the way that your system is structured. Um, or if you have a highly privatized system or if you're a tribal system, you can really, um, uh, the tool is designed so that it can be used um, out of the box as it is, um, but it's also really designed with the idea that every system is, is truly unique and that we could never uh, know or assume what your needs are. Um, and so we really want to make sure that folks are aware um, that you may need to tweak it. You may need to adjust um, various parts of the tool in order to really get the assessment that you're hoping for. Um, it is also really critically important that um, stakeholders um, are engaged in your uh, assessment discussions, um, especially those that are actually using the services that you hope to assess, right? So um, by, by that, I mean those uh, parents and caregivers, um, the youth who are currently in or who have formerly been in foster care, um, those who um, uh, have uh, um, been involved in your system in a variety of different ways um, via, um, you know, for example, foster adoptive parent associations. They're a great resource. We're going to talk in more depth about um, engaging stakeholders in your assessment, um, but we did want to mention it here because that is something you need to think about really early on in an assessment um, because bringing those stakeholders together is, is a really important and critical part uh, of having an effective assessment and having a meaningful assessment. Um, 
So um, that's something to keep in mind really early on. You're also going to want to um, gather data and information. So as we look at the tool, think about what information you might need um, that would help inform these assessment discussions, right, with your stakeholders. Um, it might be that you are um, needing to bring um, uh, demographic information about uh, foster homes available in your jurisdiction or in a specific area of your jurisdiction, or you're bringing your AFCARS data to the table, or maybe you have um, exit interview data from um, families who've left your system and um, kind of um, more qualitative data there that can help inform um, what you're hoping to accomplish here with this assessment, what you're hoping to improve about your system. Or maybe you have um, evaluation data from various services that you want to make sure are incorporated into your assessment. Um, so there's a lot that you could bring to the table there. So, so be thinking about that as we as we look at the tool itself. Um, and also, um, as you'll see when we look in the tool, you're going to want to define how you handle uh, disagreements in how you are rating various services within this tool, within this assessment. Um, the reason you're bringing all of these diverse stakeholders together is the, because you're going to disagree <laughs> and because you might have really different opinions about what um, is needed in your in your support service array. Um, and so you're going to want to think about how you're going to handle um, these discussions ahead of time, right? Knowing that by the very nature of having these discussions, you're going to have disagreements, okay? So you're going to want to think about that ahead of time. So now, without without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and take us into the tool itself. So if you might see a glitch in your screen here, and you might want to expand the viewing area um, of the, uh, the GoToWebinar control panel that you have open or your, um, or your web application, just because I am going to be um, moving it uh, into an Excel document, which is the tool, OK? OK, so now everybody should be seeing the Support Services Assessment Tool, which is an, um, a, an Excel spreadsheet, OK? So you should see the Adopt US Kids logo up here at the top. And it says Support Services Assessment Tool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, briefly walk you guys through the tool itself so that you have a good understanding of what we're talking about when we're talking about this tool that's available, as well as how to engage in a robust system assessment. Okay? Um, I did want to mention, as we're on this first sheet, which is the instruction sheet, um, that there may um, uh, there, this is a very uh, quick overview of, uh, of how you would engage um, this tool in your system assessment. The, as Alicia mentioned previously, there is a companion guide that is available um, that goes along with this tool that has lots of, of great um, strategies and suggestions, and it actually has an entire legend in the, in the guide that defines all of the services and the metrics and any of the terms that you'll see in the tool. So I did, uh, we're not going to go over, you're not going to see the guide today just because that takes up um, too much time and we're going to be going over a lot of the content um, uh, separately. But I did want folks to be aware of it, that this tool doesn't exist um, in a vacuum, that we that this guide does go with it and it can really help you understand the tool and understand how to engage in system assessment. Okay, um, So I'm going to move us, if you can see down at the bottom, there are these five sheets. So the tool is made up of five sheets. So I'm going to click on quality metrics. Okay. So this is the first sheet that you'll see, um, and on the left-hand side, you'll see that there are many, many different services. I'll scroll down for you here. Many different services on the left-hand side in the very first column, right? We have organized these services by service category because we felt like that that was a good way to kind of understand how uh, families might be utilizing those services um, and just a, a, a easy way to kind of capture different types of services that might go together. You might feel that this is not the right way to organize the way that your services work within your system. Um, and that, the tool um, is designed for customization, as I mentioned earlier. So you might decide, you know what? Um, we really want to do a deep dive into our training, for example. And you can absolutely do that. You might want to list out every possible training that foster adoptive kinship families uh, might want to engage in. You're going to make that this area much, much larger. Um, or you might decide, you know what? Um, we want to organize all of these things completely differently and move this all of this stuff all the way around. You can absolutely do that, okay? Um, so this sheet is designed to help you rate these services that um, are um, based on uh, domains of, of quality, okay? And I'm going to read, because all of these um, uh, 
metrics up at the top are written uh, not, are written up to down instead of left to right here, so they're hard to see. So I'm going to make sure that you guys can can um, read and understand these here. Um, the first thing that it's asking you is if the service is provided at all within your jurisdiction. So that's an easy yes or no answer, and that is something that you'll see on both the quality and the accessibility metric sheets. Okay. Um, it, it may be tempting, I think, to um, if you're if you're not providing a specific service that we've listed, it may be tempting to say, oh, we'll just delete that whole row. I would really encourage you guys to, as you're doing your assessment, um, to continue to include services that even even if you're not providing them within your system, just because that is by itself informative, right? If you if you have, um, oh wow, you might be able to see, you know what, um, our peer support um, service category is really lacking. We really, you know, only have services that are available um, to um, parents and caregivers. We don't really have as many available to children and teens, right? You may be able to see that as long as you're leaving those services up, even if you don't actually provide them within your jurisdiction, okay? Um, so as you're going through, you're going to first decide if you uh, are actually providing the service within your system, right? Um, so you're going to just say a yes or a no. And then you're going to be um, assessing how well this service works in terms of all of these quality metrics. So the first one here is um, adoption and permanency competence. Right. So is this service something um, where providers um, have specialized training in, in the core issues of adoption, foster care and kinship care? Right. Um, if they're understanding um, how adoption or permanency impacts identity and development and relationships. Right. Um, are they trained in that type of thing? OK. Um, the next is, is uh, if, if the service is trauma informed. Right. Um, so, it, it, you know, is. Um, do the providers have an understanding um, uh, and of trauma and the far-reaching impacts that all types of trauma have on, um, on development and on behavior, right? Um, the next over here is, um, is it designed with uh, family and youth input and impact, right? So, um, and feedback rather. Um, do youth and, and young adults who've experienced foster care and, and, and resource parents have they shaped the design and the implementation of that service, right? Um, and how how is their feedback incorporated in to that service, okay? Um, the next one is, is it family focused, right? Or does the service engage the entire family as appropriate, right? Is the child seen as both a unique individual, but it's also as, a, as an integral part of a, of a family system, right? Um, and the, the last that we've included here, is it outcome evaluated or evidence-based, right? Is, is there, um, you know, through rigorous evaluation practices, is, is their service found to be effective, right? That's that's really important to know. Um, we've also included, as you can see up here, areas where you can add your own metrics into the tool. Are there things that we didn't think of or things that are really, really important to know as part of your system to assess that service in terms of quality, right? So you can add as many different metrics as you'd like, right? And that Anything that you're adding that is um, um, really based on your unique knowledge of your system, it's going to make your assessment better. It's going to make it more meaningful for your stakeholders and for your system as a whole if you're really if you're you're taking ownership of this tool and customizing it and making it fit your system in the best way. Okay, um, so. Uh, as we, uh, I'm gonna uh, move us along here to talk about the accessibility metrics sheet. So as you can see here, I'm down at the bottom again in the sheets, and I'm moving us to the next sheet, okay? So as you can see, or as you can hopefully see, um, all of the services on the left-hand side are the same. You're evaluating all of your services again, but this time in terms of how accessible they are. These are all accessibility metrics, okay? You're again asking if you provide these, this service or not, because you're not gonna assess how well a service is, is, is administered if you're not providing it. So on each of these sheets, you're, you're uh, answering if you provide it or not. But these metrics, as you can see, are different. Okay, we're asking if if the um, service is um, has broad eligibility, right? And so what that means is is the for does that service um, is the population that's eligible for that service is it broad, right? So that answer might be really different depending on the service itself, right? But um, for example, 
Um, are your post adoption support services, are they um, available just to families who've adopted from foster care, or are they available to families who've adopted privately or internationally? Are, are they available to guardianship families, right? Um, are they available to um, all kinship families um, and not just those who've received licensure, for example. Um, these are the type of things that you need to be asking if you're if you're really wanting to assess how well your service is working uh, within the context of families um, and how they're how they're interacting with your services with uh, in their everyday lives. Okay. Um, the next up here is is financial accessibility, right? Well, that's that's fairly self-explanatory, but it is the is the service available at no or very limited cost? Is there a sliding scale available if it, if there is a cost associated with it? Um, and, um, and what is in place uh, to help families who may not be able to financially um, access some of these services that are that do have a cost associated with them? Okay. The next is uh, geographic accessibility, right? It, it how far are folks having to drive to access these services? And um, not just drive, is it accessible on a, on, um, a bus line or a metro line? Um, is it really only accessible within metro areas? How far away is it and how much time are folks having to spend on actually getting to the service before they actually receive it, right? Um, this one is a big one that I think is really important to, to really think critically about. Um, is the service well known and is it publicized? Um, you wouldn't think that this is becomes um, that this is such an important thing to measure when you're thinking about your services. But how are families going to access your services? How are they going to use these real, these great services that you have available if if they don't know about them? Um, and um, so it, it's important to really evaluate how uh, your service is publicized. Is it um, available on a website? And how often is that website updated? And um, how do families uh, know about them who maybe didn't come through the foster care system, right? If we're talking about uh, post-adoption support services or guardianship support services, um, how do they know? How do they find this information? What about families that don't have access to um, internet in their homes, for example. Um, it's really important to be thinking about all of those things as we assess how well our services are working. Um, rapid availability. Um, uh, this has to do with our really great, our really great services that may have a wait list that's a mile long, right? Um, we, uh, I think, a lot of families encounter that all the time, um, where we advertise the services that are available to them, and they go to use them, and then it's available in nine to twelve months, right? Um, and that it's great that this service is there, but if it's not there when families need it, how effective is it, right? That's what we're getting to the bottom of here is how effective are the are all of these services in meeting families' needs day to day, okay? Um, this next one is about ongoing availability and sustainability. How likely is it that that service will be here in a year, in, in three years, in five years, in 10 years, right? Is that service something that families can count on, right? Um, I think this becomes particularly important if you're thinking about services that are provided um, by independent organizations, right? These great services that may be provided by, um, by foster adoptive parent associations that are independent from your formal child welfare system um, and that are services that really help families um, how do we know that those services are going to continue to be available? This is about assessing how well we know that, and if we don't think that they're um, necessarily uh, sustainable, what can we do to bolster those services, especially ones that are high quality and are meeting families' needs? Okay. Um, and of course, it's really important to think about how culturally relevant and accessible um, the services are that we provide, right? Um, are staff trained um, in, in cultural competence and in, in, um, in, uh, implicit bias, right? Um, is, is the service available in all of the languages um, that are necessary for that community, right? Um, do they understand the needs of that community that are unique um, to the, the culture that is, um, uh, that, is that that community um, has in, um, uh, do they understand the community they're serving is really what that gets down to. And again, we have other areas where you can add other metrics. Um, so we would really encourage you to do that. So now I'm going to show you how um, this uh, tool works in, if you're engaged in an assessment. Okay. So let's, let's just take training as an example. Okay. Um, let's say I'm wanting to assess how um, accessible my training is for my pre-service training. Um, we are using a scale up here that's listed right here on both the quality and accessibility metrics. Um, the scale is from one to four. 
uh, one means that that service does not perform well. It performs poorly along that one metric, okay? Two means that it per performs fair, right? Uh, three is good and four is excellent. Um, so if we're thinking about, so we're saying, yes, I, I provide, um, my system provides pre-service training, um, and let's, I'm just going to put in some numbers here between one and four. We're going to say, yeah, it has fairly broad eligibility. It's a three. So as I put that in, it's going to automatically, the tool itself is going to automatically color code that uh, based on my answer. And it's also going to average it um, along the metric itself and also along um, uh, how well the service is doing across this particular domain, accessibility or quality. Okay. Um, I know I'm going a little fast here, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. Um, it, the other thing, so as you're entering information into here, so let's say I, it, this is uh, does great along eligibility, broad eligibility, um, it's financially accessible, it, folks don't have to pay anything for it, um, it can be um, not, the numbers don't have to be even either, you could do 3.5, you could do 2.8, whatever. Let's say oh, pre-service is really, it's not geographically accessible. It's um, really hard to access, it's really only available at the um, agency office, um, and it's not available um, uh, in more rural communities. They're having to, you know, they're having a hard time getting here, and so we're going to say that that's like a 1.5. So if anything is below a 2, it's going to show up as red. And if anything is between a two and a three, it shows up as yellow. So this is just a demonstration of how the tool itself, just by the very nature of you engaging with it, is going to start to paint a picture for you. It's going to start to give you a little bit of information about how well these services are performing across these metrics um, just as you're entering them in, right? And so that everybody can see, okay, well, we're doing okay in this area and not doing so well in this area. Um, at this point in your assessment, though, it would be really important to not make decisions uh, based on, oh, this is a one, we need to address this red. We have red across the board here, right? Let's pretend I'm like, oh, gosh, we're doing really bad in the area of geographic accessibility. It can be, it can be really tempting um, as you're engaging in this assessment to um, want to um, make decisions as you're talking with folks, right? And we can see, oh man, all of this red here, this is intimidating, right? Oh, it doesn't look good. Um, it's really important to wait though, um, and to, for you to get a fuller picture of how well your assessment, um, how, how of your entire support service array, right? That's what we talked about earlier, that in order to understand what families experience day to day, we need the whole picture. And so the assessment itself is, is starting to paint a picture with this color coding and with our number system and we're starting to get a better understanding but we're not we're not by any means done right we're just starting out as we're starting to put in this information um, so that's just a really important thing to keep in mind um, I'm going to draw your attention now to this um, this uh, fourth sheet that's called your results okay down here at the bottom and as you can see um, this sheet is averaging how well each service is doing across the entire domain of either quality or accessibility. So you can see those numbers that I put in into the training, right? They're being averaged right here, and I don't have to do anything to that. That's automatically happening so that you're, after your assessment, you're going to leave your assessment with these already filled out um, sheets that are available to you to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, talk further about with your stakeholders once you're done or to talk with leadership about or um, to share with your um, uh, constituency about how, how we did, what, what happened as a result of this assessment. So we were really wanting to make sure that systems, um, especially smaller systems or systems that don't have as many resources, could use this tool out of the box um, and could use it in such a way that they didn't necessarily have to have an evaluation team um, at their disposal, or they didn't necessarily have to have somebody who is um, really well versed in IT um, to, to be able to get them their results, right? So um, this is something that automatically populates for you as you're entering in the uh, quality and accessibility metric sheet, okay? Um, I also uh, wanna talk about this last sheet, which is your results charted. Um, I'm going to talk in more detail about this sheet um, as we um, uh, move farther on past the demonstration here, okay? So what I mostly want to share about this is this is a chart 
that again is pulling information directly from your assessment that you're doing, okay? So let's pretend I was putting stuff into the training category, right? Let me put in some more phone numbers here. It's, oh, it's good in that area. Well, we're doing okay. <laughs> um, doing, oh, not so great there, okay? Um, as I move, as I entered that, as I move over here, you're gonna see a dot appear on this uh, chart. What this chart is, is a four quadrant matrix model, which you don't necessarily have to know that in order to understand what you're being told when you, when you see this chart. Um, what you're looking at here is how well this service category, on average, performed across both quality along the bottom, along the X, and accessibility along the Y axis there, right? So you're seeing that the overall training in this pretend jurisdiction is uh, you know a little more than a two and is a little a two and a half in terms of accessibility. So um, you can see that for services and service categories that um, would be in the top right quadrant of a four quadrant matrix model, uh, those services would be high quality, high accessibility, right? Those are, are services that are overall you're assessing or performing fairly well, right? This quadrant that's down in the bottom left are those services that are lower quality and lower accessibility that maybe um, need some help um, and need some um, uh, need some assistance in, in um, helping really helping families in the way that they're um, that you're hoping that they do right um, there it this uh, in the bottom right hand corner would be um, uh, services that are high quality and low accessibility, right? So you might find that you have some high quality services, um, but they're, they're just less accessible to families, right? So this this um, uh, this four quadrant matrix model helps give you a snapshot, um, and that's really all it is is a snapshot, right? Of of how well all of your service categories are doing, and basically what you overall learned from your assessment. Within this, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, uh, a little bit later, um, you do lose some of the nuance, right? So as I'm talking about training, I might see, oh, my pre-service training was performing much better than other types of training, right? Let's say it was like, oh, these are all, these are all ones and twos and this didn't do as well, but maybe my pre-service training was doing better, right? you're not necessarily gonna see that nuance because you're still taking it from an average, right? See that hardly moves that dot. And so I do think it's important to know that, to know what this tool does and what it doesn't do as you're approaching and using it as a, as a part of your assessment process, right? Um, I do wanna pause here before we get farther on and see if anybody has questions about the tool itself. Um, we're going to talk much more about um, how this uh, assessment would work, and we're going to engage a little bit in um, uh, in a mock assessment of, of ourselves using some poll questions, but I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions about the tool itself. Hi, Britt. It, this is Mary. It looks like we don't have any questions about the tool itself. Um, yeah, it's Everybody a lot to take one. in. <laughs> yeah. And so if you if you have questions as we move forward, please don't hesitate to put them in the questions pod. I know it's a lot to take in here. OK. Um, and there, it's a lot. We're talking about a lot of things at one time, and that can be really challenging. Um, so what I would like us to do here, I'm going to move us forward is to pretend that we're all a part of one uh, one system and we're all engaging in an assessment, okay? Um, so I'm gonna do some polls here. And what I would like you to do, we're gonna talk about respite care because we know that respite care is something that a lot of families say is um, one of the things that they need most, but also one of the things that they're most challenged to get, okay? So what I would like you guys to do, I'm gonna launch a poll here, um, is I would like you to um, rate um, how well your respite services are in your jurisdiction uh, and how they rate in terms of adoption and permanency competence, right? How adoption or permanency competent are your respite care services in your, in your jurisdiction? Just gonna give it a moment here as folks are, are voting. I appreciate you guys taking the time to do this today. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna close this and we're gonna take a look at it. Okay, 
So it looks like about 35% of folks are saying, oh, it's poor, or voting it as a one. Um, oh, 38% said it's fair and 27% said it's good, right? So we know that the reason that you guys are, are, are giving different answers is because you're all a part of different jurisdictions. But, but let's imagine that this was how this discussion was shaking out in our, uh, juris our own one jurisdiction's assessment, right? How our state or tribe um, or county um, we're coming together and wow, we're getting, we're getting some different responses to that, right? We have some folks that are saying, oh, it does, it does a terrible job. I think it's really, really terrible. And some folks that are saying, no, I, I, I think it could be better, but I think it's fairly good. So this is what we were talking about, what I was talking about earlier when we're talking about how do we, um, how are we going to handle these differences in our ratings, right? So you might find, for example, that, um, uh, parents and caregivers who are actually utilizing the services may rate how well the service performs very differently um, than how the staff rates it or how leaders in, um, in agencies are rating the service, right? So it's, it's, it's really important. That might be an important way um, to uh, log how your uh, services are doing. You might say, um, okay, well, we're going to, you might decide that we're going to average all of these together, or you might decide, well, that loses too much nuance. I, I think we should have a rating that's the average of what the parents and caregivers and youth said and an average um, of what the staff said. And that might give you a, a good understanding of, of how, um, uh, of, of the differences in opinion in the room and, and how services are being um, interpreted and received um, within the communities that you're actually serving, right? So that's just one example. So I'm going to hide the results. Let's pretend that we were going to, okay, FAIR got the most votes, okay? Let's pretend we're just trying to average them all together. And so um, I'm going to go uh, back to my, oh, did I hide it? Well, okay, I'm going to go back to my tool here. Britt, I think you have to hide your, I think you started a different poll maybe. Oh, okay. Well, let's or, just do that poll. Sure. Okay. We'll do another poll again here. Can you guys see this poll? It says rate how trauma-informed respite care services are in your jurisdiction. You guys could do that. Okay. I'm going to give everybody a, a one more minute here. Okay. And we're sharing that. Okay, so a lot of folks here. Some more consensus here, a little bit more consensus here, right? But you can see how this is would be how a conversation might unfold, right? Where you have some folks, you know, about a quarter of the folks saying, oh, it's, it's really poor, but 62% are kind of coalescing around fair, and oh, there's definitely some work that could be done, but really we think it's doing well in this area because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and you could see how that really, um, could affect how your rating system works out, right? Um, so, let's see. High results. Okay, are you guys seeing my tool again? No. No. Okay. Well, let's just move on then, because what I would what I would show you is how we would rate that within the tool itself. So I would be placing a two under respite care um, um, in uh, uh, of the general support service category, and placing another two, and you would see how it starts to take shape, right? How that as as a system, how we would start to assess how well this is doing. Um, I have some other polls of how. Um, let's do the accessibility an, an accessibility poll here. So if you would. Um, please rate how well, um, how financially accessible your support services are, your respite care services are rather. Okay, let me give folks a minute here. Okay, we're sharing with you. 
oh, okay, so folks feel like it's a little better in this area, right? Um, and this is a great example of how you might really want to parse this apart and say, um, well, our respite care services are, are really financially accessible to uh, foster families and licensed kinship families, right? Those might be free, but for families that are post-adoption or guardianship families or, or kin that aren't licensed or however it shakes down in your system, um, they might be, have very different answers, right? So what you might want to do um, and what you can do within the tool is, is peel that apart and say, okay, well, first we're going to assess respite care services for foster families, and then we're going to assess respite care services for kinship care families, and then we're going to assess guardianship families. And you can see how that would go on, and you might get really different results, okay? One more poll here, if you would please humor me. <laughs> um, if you would, rate how geographically accessible your respite care services are in your jurisdiction. All right, a couple more minutes. And by that, I mean seconds. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it, share it. Okay, so we're, uh, this one coalescing around FAIR again, but you can see how this would work and that, that might, the answers might be really different uh, for this one based on um, the region that you're talking about, right? So you might have folks um, who came to the table as stakeholders from a more metropolitan area who are saying, oh, it's, it's I think it's great. It's very geographically accessible. And then folks that are from a, a more rural community are like, oh, no, it, it not at all. It's performing poorly in that area. And so that goes to the importance of having lots of different perspectives and lots of different folks at the table uh, to talk about how well your system is, is working, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to hide that. Okay. I'm not sure why it's still showing the poll. Well, let's go back to the PowerPoint itself, okay? Does anybody have any questions about the tool or about um, how you would start to engage in this type of assessment? Hey, Britt, it's Mary again. We do have a question about the Great. tool, um, which is, and I don't know if you can go back to it or not, but um, yeah. it, the question is, you know, if you are gonna add your own either services or um, to adding rows to add new services or adding columns to add different yep. information. Will that change how things line up either in the results tabs or, you know, will it question. affect the results? That's a great question. So it really depends on what you're wanting to do with it. You can absolutely add rows to the tool. Um, and as long as you're adding it within that particular service category, uh, like if you're wanting to, for, like we were talking about with respite, if you're really wanting to peel that apart and add a bunch of rows under the respite uh, service category, um, you can absolutely do that. Um, and um, you can do that by at, and it would not affect the averaging uh, of those, um, uh, of those, of that service category, and it would still show up in the um, four quadrant matrix model that we, we've developed there. So you could even add into those rows, like you could have a respite, you could, as you talked about, if you wanted to do foster parents and kinship parents, kinship caregivers differently, you could even do those in a separate row to be able to vote differently for those, for example. Right, exactly, exactly. And you could you could uh, have this assessment done um, uh, uh, differently uh, by different groups of stakeholders, right? You could, you could there are, are so many different ways that I'm sure that we haven't even thought of um, that might be helpful for, for your system. Um, I'm having trouble getting it out of the poll and I'm not sure why. What we might want to do is... Did you up. share the results? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's and just okay. while we're, while we're go. getting this back, oh good. Yay. I was just going to add, okay. um, as Britt was saying, that you could add the, um, add, Britt and Mary were saying you can add these elements. Uh, it, it will incorporate those into the average, though, correct, Britt? So if people right. are adding these yeah. things, it so will. Here, now that we're back right. in the tool, I'm now we can show, show you it. how that works. Right. Yay! Okay, so what you would do here is you would go up and you can add um, uh, rows, just as you would to any any spreadsheet, right? I'm just inserting a row here, and let's say I'm doing okay. We're going to assess um, for um, respite for uh, foster families, right? So you can say, I, I'm giving that uh, a two, I'm giving this a three. So it's still color coding it and it's still impacting the averaging, 
right? As you can see down there, it's still going to impact the averaging in this. So go lower down. I'm in the year results sheet, right? So it's still impacting that. I'll show you how it changes as I. This is my new my new row that I just added in here, and it's impacting the average, not by much, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's that's still incorporating into that. Um, and then I would have to add. Let's add some more things um, that we had talked about that we said that it was fairly broadly accessible. Okay, and that's doing like that. So it will also still show up in your four quadrant matrix model. And you can move these labels around if they're bothering you. You should be able to do that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's fully customizable and it'll still maintain all of the um, uh, uh, tools that it has available to you and all of the automatic population and all that good stuff. Great. Great, thank you. That is the only question we've had on sort of the technical aspects of the tool, so. Okay, well, let's let's keep it moving then. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint here. Okay, um, so I want, so this is this is a screenshot of, of how, what it might start to look like for your system, right, as you're, um, uh, starting to to fill out this whole sheet, and you, as you can see, it really it starts to paint a picture, um, and you can see how it becomes helpful to to continue to have those services that you're not um, uh, providing to still be in your uh, assessment because you you get this big blank line, and it is um, it informs you about oh well that's not something that we're providing, and so that's not incorporated into the our averages, and it still might be something that we want to look at if we're talking about improving our our support service right right. Um, so, uh, with this, as we, it's important now that we talk about what happens after this assessment, after you've, you've done all this work of bringing all of these people together, um, it feels like, um, you're, you're done when you have, uh, finally, you know, gotten all these people together and, and had these difficult and, um, you know, uh, conversations and, and disagreements that, that may be, you know, challenging, um, you know, based on where you sit, um, and, but it's really important to think about what happens after the assessment, because an assessment is, is only as good as um, as as the um, action planning that happens um, after it, and as you seek to actually improve your system based on the information that you got out of the assessment. So um, I wanted to bring us back to talk about that four quadrant matrix model again. Of course, you can't possibly see. I you know I didn't want to take the time to put in all of the information to actually populate this. So let's pretend that the the this screenshot is represents what our system got right. This was an overview, an overarching representation of, of how our system is doing, right? Um, or, or according to our assessment. Um, so as you can see, um, it, you just by looking at this, you can infer things about how well your system is functioning, right? So you see respite all the way down here. As I mentioned earlier, that's something that a lot of families need that is, is less accessible and um, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it, it's more challenging to get the, um, to get a higher quality service in that area, right? Um, so that might be something that you are wanting to look at as a system. Um, but you also have these things over here. And as Alicia mentioned earlier, before we jumped into the tool, it's really important to look at areas of strengths and not just areas of need, right? So, you know, if this were our, if these were our results, um, therapeutic supports did really well in, in terms of quality, right? It's like a 3.4, almost a 3.5 in terms of averages. That's great. It's low on accessibility. So you might be thinking, um, oh gosh, well, we need to figure out a way as a system to bolster um, uh, our therapeutic supports and make sure that more folks have access to those high quality services that we are already providing, right? So these are the kind of things that can that this type of, of uh, uh, graph can really help you with. I do wanna make sure that we note though, that this, this is not the only way to assess um, to, to interpret your, your assessment data, right? You There are lots of different ways to do this. This is the way that, that we incorporated into the tool that you can use out of the box. You might decide um, that you want to um, uh, plot all of your services on a map and color code how well the service did across different metrics, right? That might be something that's, that's more meaningful to you as, as part of how your system functions. 
Um, or you might decide that this is this is too much of a bird's eye view and you're losing too much nuance with this. So you might decide, you know what, I want a four quadrant matrix model of each service category, right? You want to really get in there and um, and you might have one of these on just peer support and so that you're assessing peer support for caregivers and, and mentoring for caregivers and parents and mentoring for children and teens and you're really digging deeper in there so that you can get more of that nuance back. You, you could, there are lots of different ways for you to assess um, and interpret and understand your information that you're getting out of this assessment, right? Um, let's see, so let, let's move on to talk about action planning, right? So the action planning in a lot of ways is, is the most important part of your assessment. Um, and really, we, we can give you ideas and strategies, but really your action plan is really gonna be guided by the unique results of, uh, of your assessment and by your, the, um, your system as a whole, right? There's gonna be um, a lot of different things that you might be able to do as a result of your assessment. Your assessment is probably gonna result in way more questions than answers, right? Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be unique to you, and so only you can really decide how to move forward with it. Um, you are gonna, um, uh, it could, it's really helpful to identify your priorities for your action planning with that same group of stakeholders, right? They, those one, those folks that were engaged with you and had these great, um, open, uh, difficult conversations with you, um, they can help you in interpreting this information and identifying where we need to put our limited time, energy, and resources, right? As we talk about where do we go from here? What happens now? Um, you can also um, uh, remember to learn from other jurisdictions who maybe have similar challenges to you, right? So um, if you um, are, um, that's always something that Adopt US Kids may be able to help you with. If, if you have a particular need in your state or your tribe, um, there's probably somebody who's also encountered that as well. <clears throat> and so you can always um, learn from how uh, another jurisdiction decided to handle it, right? Um, that can always be helpful. Um, and then in your action planning, you always want to focus on um, how you're going to move on to your next assessment. And that's really hard to talk about as you just finished up this like huge project of, of, of actually assessing your entire support service array. But it, it's really important that you understand um, that assessment is not, it's not a one-time thing. It's, it's an ongoing process. And in order to really actually understand what families experience, we need to continually evaluate and continually assess our systems. Um, and so your action planning should also consider um, where um, the next time you'll need to go through another assessment. Systems change, services change, um, the needs of families change over time, right? So you need to continually go back to the drawing board and continually make sure that your, your information is up to date, right? Um, so I want to bring us back again to this four quadrant matrix model. Um, there are lots of different strategies that this particular jurisdiction could could decide to do. They might decide that wow, our respite care services are pretty poor. We want to um, um, in our next uh, request uh, for proposals or RFP, um, we really want to make sure that that folks that are getting that contract are um, uh, are training their their staff that are providing respite care and adoption competency and permanency competency, and that they're trauma informed, and that we're making sure that they have the resources available to do that, um, and so and also that um, they're advertising their services. How are they doing that? That they have to demonstrate that to you so that we can bolster um, this service and make sure that it's it's growing in terms of both quality accessibility that might be one one thing that they might choose to do um, they might also choose um, to um, uh, bolster their therapeutic services right like we talked about earlier they might decide um, let's um, uh, devote some more um, uh, resources um, to making this ver this high quality service more accessible right um, so this is not a one-size-fits-all process it's also um, important to remember that you would want to incorporate other um, uh, other sources of data into your action planning, right? <laughs> your assessment is a great source of information, but this didn't happen in a vacuum. And so um, it's really, you might have some great data about, um, you know, maybe families that have been surveyed about use of some of these services. Incorporate that in. Make sure that you're using data that already exists in your system um, to uh, also inform your action planning. Um, 
So uh, yeah, so we've talked about how you might want to make funding decisions based on, on, on the results of this. You can make a case for additional resources. Um, you can um, Something that may come up for a lot of systems um, is you may find that as a result of your assessment that um, you really need to improve your, um, your, uh, uh, the way you evaluate your services because it might be that you just don't know. Um, you might not have the answers to some of those questions, right? Especially along the quality metrics, you might be like, I, I don't know if these services are, are trauma-informed or Option confident, or if they're, you know, um, uh, if they uh, incorporate feedback from youth and families into their services, I don't know. So it might be that your entire action plan, or a portion of your action plan, is to um, improve your service evaluation process, right? Um, and we talked about acting on areas of strength and not just areas of, of need. Um, I'm going to pause again and see if there's more questions, Mary. There are a few questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, First is, it, well, I mean, I'm going to start with a question of mine and then I move into this. When you talk about the stakeholders, and I think you talked a little bit about this, what are the different, who are some of the different stakeholders you can envision involving sure. in this process? Right. And Alicia's going to talk about that in just a little bit more robustly. But yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important that you're involving uh, staff who are providing those services, both frontline staff, supervisors, uh, uh, program managers, administrators. Um, of course, we talked about how important it is to incorporate um, th those using the services, the caregivers, parents, uh, youth who are in care, youth who were previously in care, um, or young adults who were previously in care, rather. Um, and you want to make sure that those folks that you're inviting to the table are not homogenous um, in other ways, right? You want to make sure they're not racially homogenous. You want to make sure that they're not geographically homogenous, right? Because like we talked about, you might get really different answers um, based on um, the specific uh, experiences of those folks, right? You might get really different interpretations. You really also want to make sure if you have multiple, um, especially if you're in a, a highly privatized system or a, um, a, a system that is uh, regionally or county administered, of uh, making sure you have um, buy-in and, and uh, folks, all, leadership from all of those different agencies at the table, um, and that they have an opportunity uh, before you engage in that assessment to really to really dig in and, and look at what you're uh, hoping to accomplish. Um, and um, uh, so that there's there's a sense of, of shared goals and, and shared ownership um, of your of your assessment because I think that can be really critical to whether or not your assessment is, is successful or not. Great. Okay. And this is Alicia. I want to I want to just jump in there since since we have this great question um, uh, and as Britt said I was going to cover it a bit later, but I think it fits here. I think yeah. also thinking about in terms of stakeholders, thinking about. Other roles where we you might not normally think about it in terms of getting feedback, but for this in particular, if you have any of your support services contracted out or under grants, think about involving staff from the the contract management or grants management um, team, so that you, so that they're hearing this part of the assessment and the discussion as well as contributing their perspectives, because that can be another lens that people may not always bring into this. And I think then also considering. Um, your system structure, as Britt has mentioned, if you are um, if you are partnering with a lot of community organizations to provide services, or if you are a county administered state or privatized in various ways, bringing in um, both staff from those various levels, um, but also s uh, both staff and service recipients who have access services. You know, if it's through um, a county provision versus a statewide program, or if it's in um, a tribal community, if there's one organization that you're partnering with that covers many of the services, making sure you're bringing in stakeholders from that agency and families who've accessed services from those those agencies. So you're really getting that um, that wide diversity of perspective that reflects the way your system is structured for providing these services. It's, I think it's a key piece for thinking of those stakeholder groups. Great. Okay. So then the next question um, is, so how do you compile results across? You have all of these different stakeholder groups. Um, you know, do you have them all rated individually or how do you compile? How do you bring it all together? Such a great question. And the answer is it depends on what you want to do. It, um, there are lots of different ways that you can handle that. Uh, uh, you could um, separate your 
stakeholders into different work groups, right? And maybe there's representation from um, uh, all of these different uh, subgroups within those work groups. Um, you could have, uh, like we talked about earlier, you could have the, the, the parents and caregivers. This is their, this is what their answers are versus staff. Um, you could have everybody, this could be a survey. This could be something that you're sending out to folks um, as part of an ongoing larger discussion about your support service array. Um, and maybe you are compiling lots of different answers and the, the benefit that uh, to doing it that way would be then you have everybody's individual assessments it would be a lot of um, uh, it would, so then you could uh, you know um, uh, understand and interpret the data differently you could say okay this is what all of the parents said uh, this is what youth and young adults said um, this is what um, the overall averages were this is what staff said this is what frontline versus administrators said this is what contractors said you could really piece it apart um, you know, you would, uh, in doing it in the survey style, you would, you know, maybe uh, lose some of the the face to face conversation of it, but you you would benefit from it in other ways. So there's lots of different ways that you can engage in um, in kind of compiling all of this information together. And I think there's a lot of value in um, in looking at it from a lot of different perspectives, in in graphing it in a lot of different ways, and charting it in a lot of different ways. Because as you can see, just as we were uh, doing that one little simple exercise, you get a lot of different information based on people's interpretation of um, from where they sit, right? And so the way that you assess it, the way that you are continually piecing it apart and putting back back together as you interpret your results, um, it's going to continually paint you a different picture. So the more you can can manipulate it, the, the more that you can uh, uh, understand it in different ways that make sense for you and make sense for the way that you learn or the way that your community learns, um, it can really help you better understand how your systems are working. Yeah, and I think I'll just reiterate that I think, you know, if you had all of your caregivers are giving it a one and all of the staff are giving it a four, if you just average those, you lose. That's not going to work. Yeah. I mean, again, you, you may end up sort of like in the right place, actually, but you may have lost that there's, the there's important discussions to, to be had. Right. Still. Yeah. Um, and see, and that by itself is an important piece of information that you would have gleaned from your assessment, right? Like that by itself is like informative that you have, wow, that uh, agency staff are saying that this is one of our best services. This is, a, it performs well and, and families are saying, no, <laughs> not so much. Um, and it is, that's why it's so important to have those using the services at the table when, when you're engaged in this kind of assessment. And that is that leads to the next question, the only other question we have right now, which is okay. how often would you do this assessment with the families you serve? Oh my gosh. So I think that it would be really important. Um, I, 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 I'm hesitant to give a time frame because I think it really depends on how your system works um, and how uh, your system is already set up to engage in um, in this type of process. But in the in the guide, we had suggested that you're at least coming back every, you know, um, uh, between one and five years. Um, to to come back to the table and and see how especially as you look at action planning as you look at changes that you might have put in place it's going to be really important um, that you uh, come back and do an assessment again um, to understand if those changes were impactful or not because uh, if you if you make the changes without without um, coming back through and and looking at everything again. Um, uh, did you really improve what you had aimed to, um, or is there is there another opportunity that presented itself now that we can now spend our energy on um, as we move forward from this assessment, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that it it, it depends lar a lot on um, on the scope of your action plan, right? On on how many uh, goals you set out to accomplish, and because um, you you could easily see that some some smaller changes it, it may be important to come back after a year and see how well that does other ones that are you're you know talking about larger system shift um, it might be more impactful um, and easier to understand your assessment um, results if you come back later on a couple years down the line um, but it really is important to incorporate ongoing assessment into your action plan great so it looks like that's it for our questions for now Great, awesome. So, and with that, we're talking about a lot of difficult things, right? Action planning is hard, and and system change is hard, and it's these are big ideas, and it's a, it's a lot to take in for sure. Um, but I also wanted to give you some some takeaways for immediate improvement um, that you could immediately, um, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, use after your assessment is done. These are things that you could do with, with minimal um, uh, uh, you know, influx of resources that you could do once your assessment is done as you're also moving forward with your action planning. These don't take the place of your action planning, um, but they can absolutely, um, uh, there are things that could be done in conjunction with your action planning that can help um, you feel, uh, you and your community and your stakeholders feel like, oh, look, th these are concrete things that are um, available to us now because we engaged in this difficult work, because we, we decided to come together and have these difficult conversations, and now we have these things available. So one is to create a work group from your stakeholders, and that's one of the things we were um, kind of touching on earlier, was that, you know, you've gone through all this work of, of, of bringing all of these people together with these unique perspectives. Um, maybe um, the entire group of stakeholders or a subset of them become an ongoing um, work group that, that meets once a month or once a quarter um, to talk about um, the work and the action planning and to hold each other accountable uh, for, for um, the promises made during the assessment process or during the action planning process, right? That's an that's um, easy way to hold ourselves accountable and also um, to um, uh, kind of put our money where our mouth is and make sure that the, our stakeholders and our um, communities know that, that this wasn't, this wasn't for, um, this wasn't just a lip service, right? This is something that we're um, going to um, be actively engaged in throughout, right? Um, you can also share the assessment results with, with families in your jurisdiction, right? I think um, Alicia talked about earlier the, um, how this engaging in this type of assessment um, process, uh, it really helps in, in fostering trust um, and, um, and uh, transparency and, 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 um, and helps families to understand um, if you're sharing results with them, if you're sharing what you learned with them, that, that we are all responsible for how well these services work and we're all responsible for all of our kids in care, right? Um, that, these, um, that these are the responsibilities of a community and not necessarily of, of an agency or of one family, right? And so, um, sh you know, publishing them in in whatever way makes sense for your system or doing it, you know, sharing them via media or what have you um, to, so that your community knows that you're engaged in this assessment and that you're trying to move the needle, that you're, that you're um, pushing forward and in, in, in trying to make things better um, for these families and for these kids. Um, you'd also develop resources for the families to help them access these services, right? You just learned a lot um, about these services that are available to families. Um, and so especially if you have um, accessibility challenges, uh, especially those related to families not knowing that they're eligible for services or not knowing um, that services even exist, um, you might make up like an FAQ sheet of like, did you know about all of these therapeutic services in our jurisdiction that are available? And that did you know that um, families that, um, uh, that adopted internationally and privately are also uh, eligible for um, uh, post-adoption services or that, you know, unlicensed kin are available or eligible for these services too. Did you know that? Um, and making sure that the families um, uh, that are, uh, would benefit from the services are aware of them. That's something really simple um, um, that you could do as soon as the assessment's done. Um, another thing that you could do is, is train agency staff that are working with the families directly on the available services, right? Because then you're going to get better referrals um, from those agency staff, right? They're going to they're understand the services in their community better, um, and they're going to make families more aware of the services um, that might be available to them. Um, and with that, I think I've, I've talked enough. <laughs> so I'm going to hand it back over um, uh, to Alicia to talk about how you would connect the, this assessment to other larger initiatives within your system. Great. Thank you, Britt. Uh, there's so much good information here, and I know that um, we have a lot we're trying to cover. And so I just wanted to let everyone know, we, as we are wrapping up the, the time together for this webinar, I'm going to just touch very briefly on a few key ideas and really point you to the guide, the companion guide that goes with the tool to let you know um, we're just showcasing a few of the key points on some of these slides, but there's a lot more in the guide to really help you think through these process pieces and uh, planning and next steps. So um, we, we know we can't, don't have time to go into all of it today. But one of the things that we really wanted to highlight was the importance of connecting this assessment uh, process to other initiatives. And that can be helpful both for your own thinking, but also for framing w with your leadership and with community partners and inviting people to participate so that people really see that support is this integrated part of your broader child welfare system goals and how it helps you with your recruitment efforts and, and bringing in new families if you're able to reassure people about what services are available. It helps you keep the pool of families that you have now and keep them well prepared to meet children's needs. 
it helps make sure that um, when you're making placements, you're able to identify what services families can tap into and what, what will be accessible and high quality to meet their needs. Help support all of these goals. So we think you probably know that, but thinking about that kind of messaging can really um, help with that framing to get leadership buy-in and other community buy-in and helps with um, your ongoing discussions for the assessment so you can think about how else do these support services that we provide help us meet our broader goals around child and family well-being, placement stability, and permanency. We also want to show you here that it, these um, efforts connect to broader efforts that are specific plans that you're developing or reporting requirements. So just a few examples that we have here are if your system has a program improvement plan, whether that's part of your child and family service review or some other program improvement plan, um, it's really helpful to think about how this assessment and your action plan for that fit into your broader PIP goals and strategies. Um, certainly, if you're doing your diligent recruitment planning, either for your five-year child and family services plan or for your annual updates, uh, this is a great way to think about how you're, how you're going to incorporate conducting the assessment and, and applying the results and doing your action planning um, as part of your uh, approach to having a comprehensive diligent recruitment program that really recruits, develops, and supports families throughout uh, all parts of that process. And then for those of you uh, in states who are participating in the Children's Bureau's Adoption Call to Action that they've announced recently, as you're looking at breaking down barriers to uh, adoption or other permanency efforts, um, it may be helpful to think about whether this uh, assessment tool and the action planning that comes with it would fit into areas that your state has identified in terms of, for example, if you're looking at barriers to getting youth uh, placed for adoption or guardianship due to limited services and support options for families, this assessment tool could be a helpful piece to tie into that. So just on these next few slides, I, this is where I just want to highlight that we have this information available and it really does go more in depth in our guide for this tool. But we provide a lot of information on strategies for effective assessment. We, I talked about some of this a bit earlier in answering the questions about engaging stakeholders and people to have involved. But a couple examples right here that I want to highlight are if you're thinking about having that meaningful stakeholder involvement, we need to think about not just who do you invite, but how do you really make this a welcoming, accessible process? And so breaking down barriers to participation, and some of those might be logistical barriers, such as what time of day you're scheduling uh, a meeting for. Um, if you're thinking about it during the day when the, the staff are available, are you providing stipends or some other accommodations for families and youth if you're asking them to come and not just expecting that they will volunteer their time? Are you providing transportation uh, vouchers or other assistance to help people get to these meetings? Um, think about where you're holding these meetings and whether they are both um, geographically accessible but also welcoming. You know, it may be that people wouldn't want to come to uh, a child welfare agency, but is there a community space where you could hold it? So thinking about those kinds of uh, options, as well as options for people to participate, even if they can't be there in person. So the survey idea that Britt mentioned, um, or their phone interviews, or other ways to get input so that it isn't a full barrier to participation, even if people can't be there in person. And then a key piece that I really encourage you to look at in the guide is considering the power dynamics and understand, especially if there are multiple contractors involved in your services, that may feel competitive and they may be reluctant to rate their service or have their services rated in front of others. But also thinking about families having to be um, sharing their experiences in front of people who may still be providing services to their family. So those kinds of dynamics may need to may come into play and it may be helpful to really think carefully about that. So we also talked just briefly earlier about the importance of thinking about how to have this fit into your system, whether you're a tribal system, a county administered state, a state administered system, privatized, but really think about how to frame those discussions in ways that fit your system and acknowledge that. And that's where the tool being customizable itself hopefully helps you address that. So this is just, we've gone through very quickly as I, as I acknowledged, um, but we encourage you to look through the guide and see some of these tips. Uh, we really do think that the process itself for having the assessment is so valuable. These discussions are important that you'll have, the input that you'll hear really will be important. And really, we encourage you to value that uh, diversity of perspectives and invite people in who may say things that uh, might be hard to hear or might, uh, 
highlight challenges that you're facing in your system. And that's the important piece of this is to make sure you're creating space to hear that so that you can keep strengthening the system. So with that, I know we're right towards the end. I want to hand it back to Britt and she's got a little bit of wrap up to highlight some resources sure. and ways that we can help. There you go, Britt. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. Well, this is my contact information. I'm um, on the family support team here at Adopt US Kids. And I would definitely encourage you to get in touch with me if you have questions about the tool or if you're um, curious about what services Adopt US Kids may be able to help you with. Um, and you can um, stay informed about our upcoming events um, by um, signing up for our newsletter. Um, as Alicia mentioned back at the very beginning of this webinar, um, the um, our Minority Professional Leadership Development Program, which is for minorities um, uh, emerging um, and current leaders um, who are minority in the adoption field. Um, uh, the deadline has been extended to join that um, uh, our second cohort of fellows for that program, and the deadline's been extended to September 23rd. Um, so I would definitely um, encourage you to, um, to check out the uh, website, and Tracy was so kind as to put it in the chat pod there. Um, you can learn more about our MPLD program. Um, if you're interested in that or if you have colleagues interested in that, the deadline is still open. You can still submit applications. Um, and then this is where you would find resources and services from Adopt US Kids if you're interested in um, learning about the tool itself, the guide, our capacity building services, our family support uh, services, publications, webinars. We would encourage you to, um, to go um, to uh, find out more about um, how we help professionals at the Adopt US Kids webpage. Um, and thank you so much for, for staying with us today. We know we had a lot to cover and it was pretty pretty dense and I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, so yeah. um, we know you guys are very busy people. So um, please reach out to us if you um, have questions or comments um, and we would love to hear from you. Thank you everyone.